Joined this morning by Mr. Reyes. Mr. Clerk, we have the first item, please. Yes, the first item is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Mr. Anthony Braswell to the Board of Disabled Access Appeals Commissioners for the term ending June 30th, 2012. Good. And uh, Mr. Braswell here? Yes, sir. Good. Come on up to the table. Hi. Thank you. Do you know Susie Marble? Yes, I do. She's a great citizen of Los Angeles. Yes, sir. Oh, very good. Well, then I got my vote. Okay, Ed. Ed <laughs> I just want to thank you uh, for stepping up and supporting the city and appreciate your time. I know it's difficult and your contribution is generous. So thank you so much for supporting the city. Thank you, sir. All right, Mr. Breswell, I want to thank you. Uh, what is this schedule for council? Mr. Clerk, you know what is scheduled for council? Uh, this item is scheduled for council today at uh, 10 o'clock. So in council, maybe you can get us a little about your background, a little bio, et cetera, and tell them your passion. One issue that I'm interested in is there's been a uh, stories in the paper and talking to business people. There's, I, we all support the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, but there's some uh, who are small businesses who find that their parking space is a foot short or they're getting sued. I don't know if you're familiar with this aspect of it, but I'd like to get some uh, uh, le leadership positions from our commissions and our executive director on how we can try to find a way to help everybody without fining people uh, or suing them what is happening in this area. But we'll talk later when that's on an agenda. But thank you so much, and thank you for being at Cedars, which is a very special uh, institution in our community. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. So we'll recommend approval. Next item. The next item is item number two, the Department of Cultural Affairs report relative to the acceptance of a grant award from the California Arts Council for the Music LA program. Good. Please. Good morning, Saul Rumble for the Department of Cultural Affairs. This is the fourth year in which the department has successfully received the grant award from the California Arts Council to support the Summer Music LA program for the department's um, summer classes. Normally we offer eight to ten week classes, you know, in a variety of music courses. The goal is to teach students uh, basic music theory and an introduction to music, and we do it regionally throughout the city to ensure that the music courses take a flavor of the local communities as well. Um, this program is supplemented by donations from the Walt Disney Company as well as from um, Wells Fargo and the Nielsen Company as part of the Music LA's Heritage Month program. So the idea is to keep an ongoing program throughout the year. This specific grant will target the summer program, which is obviously our most intensive co you know, um, course programming because most of the kids are out during the school during the summer, and we program heavily um, in these particular areas. Mr. Reyes, uh, let me ask you two questions. What's fifteen thousand dollars buy you? Fifteen thousand dollars will buy. It'll buy us a. It'll buy us six ten-week summer programs at six different locations. We're able to get about two hundred students per course. So if we do the math, you know, it'll it'll be well over a thousand students that we'll be able to introduce to music during the summer. Very good. And then the next question, and I have no offense to the opera or to. Thing, but when you put it on hold, when you call 311, mm -hmm. you get, uh, have you ever called 311? I have. I'd rather hear Chuck Berry and talk about L.A. or uh, hear uh, other L.A. songs, Randy Newman or whatever. How do we change that? Well, we could certainly talk, I could certainly talk to my colleagues in ITA and talk about the, the music programming on the 311. And we Will you do that for us? Like. No offense to the opera, but I'd like to hear... You know, it never rains in Southern California or whatever. Music programming, different programming throughout the day. I don't see why 311 can't. Or Chuck Berry in Promised Land. So, whatever. We love it. We love it. Very good, Mr. Ray. Then we'll get, uh, uh, I, I did it. It's on my hit parade. I'll give you my hit parade. Uh, who did that song? Um, uh, do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Who oh, does that? Uh, yeah, it's a classic. Uh, yeah, that's Low Rider. Yeah, I like that song. So all of that would be helpful, I think. So we'll look at it. We'll go into your private thank collection you. if you'd like. All right. <laughs> Not my private collection. It's public collection. <laughs> okay, thank you. We'll recommend approval for the grant. Next item. Uh, next item is number three. This is continued from the meeting of February 22nd. 
It's the City Attorney Report and Ordinance in response to Motion Parks Perry relative to amending the Los Angeles Municipal Code to prohibit conducting any trade, occupation, business, or profession within a city park without a concession contract or a permit issued by the city. Mr. Reagan. Good morning, Council Members. Kevin Regan, Assistant General Manager with the Department of Recreation and Parks. So item three, uh, as you just heard, is an amendment to the Municipal Code. Section 6344 uh, is being amended. If you'll recall, in 2005, this, sec this particular section of the Municipal Code was suspended due to litigation that was surrounding some of the First Amendment issues at Venice Beach. That case has since been settled, and uh, City Attorney has now redrafted the ordinance. Uh, it, it's slightly different than the original section, and what it will allow is for enforcement of uh, the Municipal Code as it pertains to people selling items in parks or conducting business in public parks without having a concession agreement or a permit. It's something that the Department of Recreation and Parks and the city actually has needed for a number of years. And uh, speaking on behalf of the department, we're happy to see this um, amendment moving forward. Mr. Reyes. So the biggest difference is that we tied up a legal loophole. Is that the essence of this? Y yes, that's <coughs> correct, Councilman. Um, what there was some legality regarding the way that the ordinance was actually uh, written. So, uh, what what this particular redrafting of 6344B will do, it will allow for uh, expressive items um, to still be sold. These are and, and things like newspapers, leaflets, uh, bumper stickers. You know, free expressive First Amendment types of items are not curtailed. The activities at Venice Beach are not curtailed in terms of those individuals that are expressing their First Amendment rights. But what it does do is it targets individuals that are vending or selling uh, items in parks or trying to conduct a business in a park without having a permit to do so. So yes, it, do, it does. Since the case, since the litigation has been settled, we can now redraft the ordinance and move forward. Great. This is non-concession, non-food items. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it would really, I mean, it would pertain to any items other than expressive, uh, you know, First Amendment okay. protected items. Okay, so to my understanding, but we may want to ask the city attorney. Yeah, so I want to get an understanding. If someone wanted to sell food, they'd have to get a license or a permit from the department. That's correct, Councilman. If, if an individual wanted to sell food in a public park, they would need a, a couple of different permits. Number one, they would need a health department permit. Number two, they would need a permit from the Department of Recreation and Parks issued under the uh, under the authority of the Parks Commission. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to understand the, um, well, first, let me ask this question. Do we have a process and or a permit, uh, a document that allows vendors to come in and sell food? We do have a process. The Department of Recreation and Parks does have a process for that, yes. So let's say, um, let's say a vendor truck wants to come in, park in the parking lot and sell their food. That's illegal or that's legal? Without uh, being properly permitted, uh, once this ordinance makes its way through the system and is enforceable, that would be illegal. But mention that food trucks that come to for all soccer fields, because I think that's what okay. may help. You have a permitted food truck. If you have, if you there, there are several locations throughout the department where we have. Um, the department has put out a request for proposals, received bids, and awarded a concessions uh, contract to individuals who uh, operate trucks, food trucks, Sepulveda Basin, uh, parts of uh, Ferraro. So those are legal because they've gone through a commission-approved concession RFP. bidding process. Okay. Because as, as you know, we've got some new large parts in my district. And I'm trying to control who goes in, who goes out because of the quality issue, the health issue. Right. And um, so right now it's kind of like a no man's land. So I want to create some kind of structure that allows me to address that. 
right so i guess what i'm trying to say to you councilman is that this ordinance what is the it will do that it will help us do that yes it will help you control so what happens is individuals can't just show up and sell if if they were going to sell something it would be it would be a just a decision made you know conscious effort made on behalf of the department to actually issue a concession agreement or a permit to these individuals to sell but people just can't show up and sell things like today they do right and we have no control because our ordinance is suspended so this helps us okay okay I'll follow up with your staff and talk see how I can create some structure in those parts right and if and councilman if you're interested you know as this moves forward and we have those enforcement abilities if you're interested in having particular types of concessions or permits issued for you know food sales in particular parks we, we can do that we can work with you on that great thank you very much sure. great. Uh, mr. Wesson we're joined by mr. Wesson thank you mr. Wesson we uh, are on item number three right now it's about uh, giving uh, some correction by our city attorney to laws and issues of vending uh, also in those who in this particular case in the eighth district a dog training school came and we have a very fine deputy for mr. Parks uh, good morning council members uh, poor Vidoshi with council member Parks office um, basically um, this motion came out of an issue we had at one of our parks that um, does not have a regular uh, director that oversees the park um, we had an individual that was training attack dogs um, in the park and we had no way to allow GSD to enforce anything on this individual so um, you know we met with Rec and Parks and the city attorney and they um, brought forward this amendment to the ordinance that they said would be the best solution and um, you know kind of help along with a lot of their other enforcement issues as well so we would like um, to see this move forward great so everybody's okay with this everybody's okay I think it's gonna be good I think I want to ask just and I don't see it here but it, it's over there maybe but there used to be a little uh, uh, little placard that states you know this occupancy of this room is XYZ by the order of the fire department if there could be something on your buildings to say any sales must be permitted by the Board of Recreation and Parks Commission or whatever some sign I don't want signs all over the place but at least something that are, so you could point to so you could inform people sure we can look into doing it we can look into that council member well we don't look into it just come up with a little sign that you put on the building that says you must be approved any any selling of anything or because also it's not just dog training schools but also people do uh, yoga and other things and uh, personal GI Joe's or whatever they call them Boot camps. Boot camps. All that should be recognized in a simple sign so they could be then part of the process of, uh, of uh, what is necessary. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Reagan. Thank you. Okay. In fact, can I ask a, a question? So were you inspired by my dear friend and colleague, Ed Reyes? Is that why you're getting this bearded <laughs> look? Or I, I walked in for a minute. I didn't know who you were. What's what is up with this? See, all you, I'm jealous because I can't do it. So anyway, but what's up? Uh, well, I did. I, did life I, prices. I, 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 you know, Councilman, I've been permit. with the city. I've been with the city for 30 years, and I just turned 50, and I thought I should do something different. There you so go. I, I, so, I, so I was you, inspired by the great Councilman Ed Reyes when he when he grew out the. I, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to shave my head though yet. Oh, you got a good head of hair, Kevin. Enjoy it while you can. Yeah. <laughs> His father was a great member of the city staff for many years. Was he bearded? And no, my father was a policeman, so he never he had any. Yeah, he, he could have went undercover. Yeah, that's right. He could right. have. Good. All right, we're good. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Clerk, since we're joined by Mr. Wesson in reviewing one and two, you're okay with one and two, Mr. Wesson? Yes, I believe he's okay with one or two, uh, so we'll get that. We'll hold that for another minute just to make it possible. Number four. Item number four is a city attorney report and ordinance in response to motion Rosendahl Wesson relative to amending the Los Angeles Municipal Code to establish daylight savings time and non-daylight savings time operating hours for Stoner Skate Plaza. Okay. And before, as we call that there, I'd like to hear from the deputy for the great councilman of the 11th district, Mr. Rosendahl. Good morning, council members. Um, 
this the background in this was the council member met with some constituents concerned about um, the uh, noise and issues at uh, Stoner Skate Plaza, and so uh, uh, we we drafted a change to the ordinance to uh, change the hours on this. Um, the council member is requesting on item four that there be a verbal motion to remove section two. So, this is your skate park. Yes, at Stoner, Kevin. <clears throat> Thank you, council members. Once again, Kevin Regan, Assistant General Manager, Recreation and Parks. Um, item four, as Len Wen just stated, is, an, is also an amendment to the Municipal Code, Section 6344. And uh, what we're asking for is specific hours. The city has a skate park ordinance, actually, that lists the hours of operation of uh, skate parks. But the, uh, uh, the department and the council office in collaboration with the community in that area of uh, Stoner Skate Park determined that this particular skate park because of its popularity, because of its location, its size, needed specific hours that were different than the regular operating hours of either the rec centers or of the other skate parks. So this park in particular needs its own op set of operating hours and uh, the department is in favor of, of these hours. And uh, Hours are expanded? Um, they're not necessarily expanded there. I would, I would characterize them as being different. Um, what they do is what these hours are going to achieve is that the park will not open until uh, 10 a.m., which uh, gives uh, the community a little bit of um, uh, like quiet time in the morning before the, the skate park opens. And then it closes during the daylight savings time. It'll close around, what is it? Is it Five. No, no, daylight seven. saving time. Seven. seven. And in non-daylight saving times, it'll close at five. We also are opening at 10 a.m. because for the most part, it, not 100%, but for the most part, the individuals that use the skate park are school-aged uh, kids. And we don't, we want to just, you know, we don't want to skipping school in the morning and going to the skate park. So 10 a.m. was kind of a, a time that we arrived at with, in Good. collaboration. And I did get a call from Mr. Rosadal to remove the urgency clause. Yes. Correct. And the other item, what was the other item? There was two items. Just item two, the urgency clause. That's all that had to be removed? Yes. Very good. Mr. Uh, Weston, Mr. Uh, Reyes. Is this the only park that gets this uh, level of uh, detail in terms of hours? Are there other? I saw in the ordinance other areas that um, oh, identified. I see what you're asking. Uh, th this section of the municipal code is, talks about a number of parks that have uh, special hours. So okay. those those sections were amended. Those were already existing. Okay. So okay. those th there's parks within the city that we call sunrise to sunset. There's some parks that open an hour before sun uh, sunrise and close an hour after sunset. And then there's some parks that are have other uh, restricted hours that are stated here in the municipal code. And those are unaffected by this change. What was the? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. How did the name originate of the park? Stoner. Yeah. Uh, it's a street, uh, Stoner Avenue in, in West Los Angeles. Wondering. That would be Eugene Stoner who invented the M16. Oh, okay. I thought that it was the 1960s thing or something. That's what I was no, told. There's no, okay. The M16, no I think, I don't know, the street's been around a long time. I know it's the most stolen sign when I talked to Craig over at the uh, <laughs> shops there. So. I, thought was, I can see that. Uh, I, can. I thought it was a 60s era kind of thing. Uh, okay. No, no. Well, we do have a park. You know, there are some interesting park names. and We, can, right. we do have a park... Uh, in the councilman's district that is called yucca so you know right. kind of yuccas so yucca uh, tree yucca plant right which park in the city's history was the first sunrise to sunset park uh lake hollywood park and who initiated that? that tom give me a second here. you were too slow i don't want to keep you away <laughs> who initiated that <laughs> okay thank you very much with we're, all good. On we're all good yeah. we're all good move forward good thank you very thank much you. Okay. Councilman LeBondre, are you going to move forward with item number three? You didn't take an action. Yes, uh, yes, we'll move forward with item number three. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Item number, just to, so let's say one, two, three, and four will all be now joined by Mr. Weston approved unanimously. If that's okay. Yeah, and the urgency call has been deleted on item number four. Urgency group. Confirmed by the city attorney. Thank you. Uh, okay. 
Item number five. Item number five is a city attorney, uh, pardon me, item number five is a city administrative officer report relative to an agreement with Atonal Sports and Entertainment Incorporated for the operation and maintenance of the Chevy Hills Tennis Professional Concession. This item is scheduled in council for tomorrow, April 13th, 2011. Good morning, Council Members. Delilah Pucha, CAO. The proposed concession agreement is between the Department of Recreation and Parks and Atenal Sports. The term of the proposed agreement is five years with two five-year renewal options. This is for the operation and maintenance of the Chevy Hills Tennis Professional Concession. The concession consists of a variety of tennis programs and the operation of a tennis professional shop. On March 15, 2010, the department released a standard request for proposal. The, the department convened a three-member panel with backgrounds in tennis and contract management to review the proposals. The concessionaire was found to have the best experience in all aspects of operating a professional tennis concession and demonstrated a clear understanding of the role of municipal tennis with the strategy to provide high public participation. CAO office recommends approval. Yes, sir. That's a strong recommendation, Department. Yes, Robert Morales, Recreation and Parks. Yes, we recommend approval also. I'd like to point out two things. Um, along with, it was recommended by a panel of industry experts. Uh, Atona Sports and Tennis currently operates two of the eight concession, tennis concessions for Recreation and Parks. And as 25% of our tennis program, they generate, currently generate over 65% of the revenue out there. I uh, also like to state that Steve Bellamy, as the principal for Atonal Sports and Tennis, and his family were recently selected as the U.S. Tennis Association Family of the Year. So we are excited about this, and we highly recommend it. Okay, Mr. Reyes, how much do we stand to make as a city? According to the proposed agreement, the city, the concessioner will pay the city 10.5% of the gross receipts in rent from lessons and 12% of sales of goods and services from the tennis professional shop. The estimated rent for the five-year term is expected to be 389000 but I believe this may increase depending on the sales of the pro shop. Uh, also, just, just to um, add on to that, under the terms of the proposed agreement, the concessionaire will make improvements, including painting the tennis pro shop and installing new carpet within 60 days. In addition, they're also going to do repairs such as painting the tennis background, update the court lighting, lower the existing fencing between courts, add a tunnel bulletin boards, installing a new shower in the tennis pro shop, and a new awning and a new entryway sign. So my assumptions are that when they were competing for this opportunity, that we, would, we were able to assess levels of return monetarily to the city based on these uh, conditions? Well, in the, the department issued a standard RFP because they, they didn't use a sealed competitive. They couldn't identify the exact amount because it's subject to the sales. So in the standard RFP, this was based on those who met the criterion set forth by the department who was most qualified to run the tennis pro shop and enhance public participation. In addition to that, it happened that the concessioner was willing to provide these additional repairs and improvements, which just enhanced the opportunity for us to enter into an agreement. Mr. Chair, I, I would like to um, and please advise me here as to the appropriate approach, but if we could have like a six-month report back on what's actually being generated uh, by these concessions to understand how much, what's the opportunity cost for not selecting maybe other entities I don't have a dog in the race, but I just want to know no. how we're getting Here's what I think we should do, a full report on all concessions, not just this concessions, but all concessions. I'll do a motion, Mr. Reyes, asking that uh, within 60 days is what or, or less they report. I would like to know what they make everywhere. What do they make right. uh, on this and not this one here? But I think we should. The performance of right. our facilities and see if there's right. best practices that we could be addressing but we wouldn't know it unless we have uh, some kind of a trend analysis right. of what is coming and what's being spent. And, and I think your suggestion is great that it probably should be, we should have an introduction one here in the next right. few meetings, but then one in the fall, like twice a year. What is our projections? Because I say this in council 
whoever works at the McDonald's at Western and uh, and Romaine and Hollywood, that manager, if you call them right now, could tell you how many Happy Meals they sold between 11 and 2 by punching it up. We should have that knowledge. How much do our our facilities? Because uh, then we could point to 350 thousand dollars is a number of rec directors who working with young people at other parks uh, are doing things. And I, I want to speak to the notion of accountability. I know the parks are trying their best to create structures that allows us to follow the dollar as it comes into our parks and how it's recorded and who delivers the money and how it gets managed. And I know we've had some issues in some parks in my district. And so it speaks to the issue of systems. So if we can get a report back and look at how we are actually moving in that direction, um, what would be a good period to, is it a four month period to get some kind of gauge? Is it a six month period, a three month period? Well, we actually have data over the last five years. We can give a six month report and compare that to the prior six months and the prior year. So why don't we cut that in half so and get the three month report. Yeah. The way our budget process moves, it should be understood what we are doing, what we are not doing. I think, how about if we do a motion to ask that the department report on all concessions, listing all concessions, the highs and the lows, what is doing, we'll structure it together, we'll get a box to write it. Right. Okay, Mr. Weston, anything? Recommend approval by unanimous committee. Okay, that's item number uh, five. So that's good, very good there. You can send that forth to council as soon as you want. Okay? Thank you. Next item, uh, item number seven, the state has called. And uh, Ms. Uh, Schechter, please report on your information from the state of California, if you could, to the microphone on item seven. We're going to do six in a minute. Okay. Uh, OSHA wanted to have this item. California to Occupational Safety would like to have this item continued until the, the following meeting. However, we just realized we might have a conflict with the city attorney, so we might want to request to come back in the first this, the first meeting in May on the 16th. On the 16th, May 16th. Oh, the 10th? I'm sorry. It's May 10th. 10th. Very good. Okay, so item number seven will be continued to May 10th, request for the state Cal OSHA. Item number six is now before us. Item number six is a motion, Reyes-Perry, relative to legal options to address the viewing of pornography on public computers at the city's neighborhood libraries while being cognizant of the First Amendment rights of all citizens. Uh, good morning. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Reyes, who's the maker of the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to thank you for your diligence, uh, your responsiveness. Uh, Chinatown is probably one of the busiest libraries, I've been told, and activity, children, teachers, community. So those are a significant issue. And uh, perhaps for the uh, my colleagues, if we can just give us a brief summary of what was observed and what was done. Before there, I just want to thank you. Uh, our head librarian for the whole city joined us in my district and helped with a, a cleanup, major cleanup of one of the regional libraries of Royal Seco. And I want to Thank you publicly for that, uh, the leadership you've shown, and the fact that you had working gloves on, and those tools, and uh, raking, and, and cleaning, and it was an inspiration to the folks that were there, because it shows that you're probably overseeing hundreds, I mean, thousands of patrons, many libraries, and you spent that morning with us, and I'm truly appreciative of that, and I want to thank you in public. But thank you, Mr. Reyes. Uh, Martin Gomez, General Manager for the library. Um, I'm going to turn over the question to Cheryl Collins, who is the interim director for Branch Libraries, who was participating in uh, that event that took place last earlier this year. Thank you. Good morning. Um, on January 6th in the Chinatown branch that afternoon, uh, a patron, several patrons were waiting in line to check out materials, and they glanced over to one of our 15-minute computers. Those are computers that we have in the library that are not on the reservation system that people can just pop into the library and check their email or, or do something very quickly. And when they looked over there, they saw some graphic, sexually explicit material. Uh, they, of course, complained to the branch librarian uh, right away. Several other people saw it, too. And the branch librarian quickly 
moved the man and, and, and turned off the computer to make sure that it wasn't visible. Um, the community was very upset. This is not the type of thing that, that generally happens in the Chinatown branch. Uh, matter of fact, since that incident, we haven't had any complaints. But there was a community meeting called the very next day in Chinatown by the uh, Chinaman's Business Association. I think it was organized by uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ma uh, of that community. And um, uh, they spoke to their, their concerns uh, because it is a very busy library. And one of their suggestions was that we should move those 15-minute computers so that in the very public area where people are coming and, and standing at the circulation desk, the only computers that would be available would be those computers that only had our website, our catalog, and our databases. Um, and uh, so at that meeting, we agreed to do that. Uh, the very next day, we changed the, um, the location of those computers. Uh, we made sure that uh, all of our computers, we, we looked them over, make sure they all had privacy screens and were meeting all of the rules and regulations. And uh, the community seemed to be satisfied with that, and uh, that's what we did. One of the uh, concerns I have is making sure we don't violate the First Amendment rights. So that being said, I think as you've defined the solution, it's understanding the sight lines of how these screens are projected throughout the libraries. And if we could maintain a level of privacy without compromising security, I think we can find a win-win where no one can sue the city for violating their First Amendment, First Amendment rights. At the same time, we have to be cognizant that there are certain characters that don't have the best judgment and their behavior around children, around families in our, in our libraries. My concern is, in Chinatown, they reported this right away. How often does this happen in other libraries? And have we had any other incidents reported? Do we, ca do we have that type of diligence in being vigilant in our other libraries? That's my concern, is we, we, it was reported here, but have we assessed all our libraries to prevent such, uh, I put this um, assault on our children's senses with graphic material. Well, you know, we're very di diligent in making sure that people uh, abide by our rules and regulations. Uh, it's very clear we have signage in all the libraries that if people take off the privacy screens, if they move the monitors, if they try to entice people to look at what they're looking at on the screen, we would ask them to leave, we would call the police, we would do what is necessary. So we, do, we don't really have very many complaints. You know, we have uh, thousands and thousands of hours of people on the computers, and occasionally we do have complaints. But I, I can share with you that in certain communities, because the lack of, but, but this, because English is not their first language, not understanding the social norms of mainstream, being basically intimidated, I'm not sure if it's always been reported. So did we assess the sight lines of our computers in other libraries, or are we going to wait until someone complains? Are we actually physically looking at our floor plans, assessing the sight lines of these screens, and making necessary adjustments? Or are we going to do it on a complaint basis? Now, uh, Councilman uh, Martin Gomez, uh, I, I think this was uh, a little bit of a wake-up call for us. Certainly, we do want to make sure that uh, we don't wait for an incident to happen. Uh, we do our best to make sure that uh, staff are informed to review the procedures and the location of all the computers in the branch system. We're a large system, as you know, 72 branches across the city. We may not have been able to filter through every uh, branch, but we are working diligently to do that. Has an order or directive been given to assess those sight lines and to look at how we secure our computers, or yes, have we done that? Through the area managers of our branch library system, we have done that. So a directive has been yeah. made. Okay, thank you. Again, I appreciate your responsiveness. Um, the confidence in Chinatown has been elevated again, and um, I look forward to working with you. And um, I have a tendency to drop in the libraries unannounced with jeans and a sweatshirt, and folks don't know who I am, and I just like to assess and look, and so I appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, my questions are, uh, I drop in the libraries. My favorite the Central Library, I go down the four escalators in the Tom Bradley wing. I go look at the old maps of the city. I talk to Mr. Gleason if he's working. He used to talk to Carolyn Cole, who did the great photo exhibits uh, for friends, photo friends. But then there's the screens. And I remember uh, talking to a librarian because you could walk by the 
the computers and you could see what's on there. And I was, and then for 10 cents, you could make a copy of what you want that's on the computer. You're familiar with that. Our charging policy, right, for making prints. Yeah. So I have a picture here that's photographic, and then I have to go to a clerk who works for the city. Then they have to see what I want to look at. God, I'm not talking about me. I'm using that in a different tense, Madam City Attorney. What the vendor, what the person's looking at. Thank you, sir. And then, and then they have to pay at the public counter. I don't know if we have an obligation to that. I think it should be looked at, but also look at the screens. Are there computer screens that you can put on? Because as you walk by, and I tell everybody to go to the fourth floor basement of the Central Library, Tom Bradley Wing, to look at the old maps of L.A. So they walk by. There's a bank of computers, and you easily see what's on there. Uh, is there any way to put a screen on these computers so only those who sit within the front of it? Yeah. We are. We have privacy screens for all of our computers. Now, occasionally, a patron may take them off. That's prohibited. Uh, when we find out about that, we'll replace them. As we uh, go through uh, the system, there may be an occasion where a screen will be damaged. We have to get a new one. So, uh, the general practice is for us to have privacy screens on all of our computer terminals. Well, how's things at Central Library? Pardon me. How are things at Central Library with this issue? I'll have to check into that. I don't know for sure, but they got the same message uh, when this incident occurred to make sure that technology was up to speed. Right. And also, uh, I think it's somewhat offensive to our employees that they have to handle this. There's a, a variety of uh, uh, First Amendment bookstores throughout the city that people could find their way to if they, instead of having to worry about it in a public institution like the library. But I want to ask our city attorney, are we okay here? Well, I think, you know, a lot of these issues have not been determined. However, I think in terms of protected speech, um, pornography, unfortunately, is not illegal. Uh, I, I, obscenity, I obscenity and uh, child pornography are not protected speech, so clearly those things are illegal to access. In terms of minors, that includes material harmful to minors. All of those things are very hard to define. Somebody watching an R-rated movie and somebody walking by could por see some sort of scene of sexual nature and think it's pornography, but it's not. So again, these things are very difficult to define. I think uh, what the, in terms of First Amendment rights, you know, the if anything were ever to be challenged, you always look at what are the alternative means to protect speech for those who want access to it and shield people from necessarily not seeing things that they don't like. So I think the library with its privacy screens and its positioning of the computers is addressing it that way. Very good. So that's it. You're going to review it at all branches, including the central library. And do you have any other problems at any facilities that you want to tell us that uh, well, we were talking earlier this morning, and I think with the hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, uses for the public access computers, I think we get probably two or three reports uh, per year that something does occur. So, again, uh, in terms of the benefit of public access to uh, unfettered information, I think it's a I got that. Amount. I got that. But it's just the shock of the harm when someone has to see something that they, at, at such an age or whatever, you know, Small branch library, you don't want to uh, do that. Mr. Wesson, you're all right. Mr. Williams, we're all right. And uh, with this motion, what are we going to move forward to council, or what are we going to do on this? Sure. Move forward to council on this issue, issue, and this will then direct the staff. You'll have a little report in council on this particular issue here. And between the time it gets scheduled for council, you maybe could check with your we do want to support the First Amendment, obviously, in free speech, but we also want to protect uh, the, the, the beauty of the library, that it's not, uh, that it's a place for all. That's one last question. Yeah. Uh, we just went through a whole building program a few years ago with all the libraries. When they designed the floor plans of the libraries, was this a priority when they looked at the rooms and how they were going to establish functional space for this type of activity? But was that, do you happen to know? Councilman Rye was not here uh, during the building program. I do know that the uh, 
Well, the Silver Lake, for example, I think the idea was to position the computers in a way so that there was uh, not only some level of privacy, but there's separation between the children's section as well as the adult section. That building in particular is very bright because it's primarily uh, uh, all glass. Uh, so make sure that the screens don't uh, have the glare from the incoming sunlight. Uh, in terms of the previous projects, do you know, Cheryl? Well, you know, it's evolving, and not all the buildings were built at the same time. And, and we've learned a lot from the first buildings of where we should and should not put computers and, and that type of thing. So obviously, the ones that were at the beginning of the building uh, project, we have moved the computers several times as we've noticed problems. But in the more recent buildings, we like Silver Lake, I don't know that we've ever gotten one complaint from Silver Lake. Okay. So uh, it may be, it's probably working. Thank you. Just if I may, uh, council members, um, there are uh, certainly always new technological developments occurring within this area, and one in particular, uh, most recently, the, there's an association called ICANN, I-C-A-N-N, and basically they're the uh, uh, keeper of all the domain names for uh, uh, organizations around the world that uh, use the uh, Internet. <coughs> Um, for example, the .gov and the .org and the .com, they assign those addresses. Uh, they just passed a resolution in January to assign a .xxx a designation for pornographic sites. And as that develops, uh, it seems to me that would be in our best interest to make sure that we are uh, working to make sure that we prevent our um, you know, libraries from uh, um, having access to uh, inappropriate materials uh, by using that designation as appropriate. I just got to ask you a question, because any time I had a question when I was in school, I always turned to a librarian. How'd they come up with the X? <laughs> uh, pretty obvious, I guess. Uh, uh, I, I don't know the... I don't know. I mean, I wonder, I, you know, I don't know. You don't know how they came up with the word, your name is Mud? <laughs> the doctor who treated uh, uh, John's Wilkes Booth was named Mud. So, anyway, that's your trivia for today. We'll get uh, to Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Where did they, they call them red-handed come from? I want to know. Cattle thieves. Cattle thieves. Wow. And they would catch them red-handed after they were. With, all right. That's good. We could do this more. Good, good. good. 920 in the morning here in Los Angeles, and we're going to turn it back to some real good music. Part-time librarians, if you'd like to. Yeah, we should do that. We should get that. We could put our, what we should do is we should talk to, uh, to, uh, the good fellow who runs Jeopardy and see if we could have our librarians challenge the New York City librarians for money for libraries in a little Jeopardy match. How about if we do that? Lisa, take note of that. That'd be good. So you're going to give some guidance and give a report. I'm sure when it comes to council, will be uh, of interest to make sure that <laughs> it, we're all appropriate. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, there's no other items, no public comment. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Reyes. Right. Mr. Weston, this you, committee sir. is now adjourned. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. With the radio. Yeah. All right. See you.